This is a, uh, has become a very dear friend of mine. We go to church together, the, the Circle C Cowboy Church in Mount Pleasant. He, uh, he also uh, adds to the church service by singing, uh, for instance, uh, Amazing Grace and Charity, which is just wonderful, just wonderful. And uh, his name is Buffalo, and maybe he'll tell us uh, how he came by that name. I came by the name from the elders in my nation. Uh, I received a letter from the principal chief at the time. He said, we've decided on your new adult name. Your name will be Talks with White Buffalo. Now, I don't know if you all, most, most of you know the synonymous thought process with White Buffalo. Um, I told him, I said, why would you load a guy up with that kind of a name? <laughs> <laughs> you know, because that's kind of, that, that puts the load on your shoulders real quick. Um, he said, well, three of the guys on the Council of Chiefs have dreams about you, and they all saw you standing talking with you know who. I said, oh, thank you very much. Anyway, so I ended up with my adult name, Talks with White Buffalo. That's from the elders on the nation. Mm. Other than that, I walk a pretty basic spiritual path. Um, I do ceremony with the Hopis, I do ceremony with the Lakotas, and I do ceremony with several groups of Cherokees, so we try to keep it on the path. Don't always, but you slide every once in a while, but you've got to be just get it back together and go on down the road. That's pretty much my story. Been a contractor my whole life. That's it. So when somebody refers to you or wants to use your full name, uh, like you explained outside, and like I noticed on your card, <clears throat> it's talks with white buffalo. That is, is that sort of the full name? That is the full given name. Yes. Okay. And buffalo is, as you all know, when you get your full adult name, a lot of that is maintained as sacred. So therefore, you don't really give that information out to everybody. You merely use buffalo. Okay. Well, thank you, uh, Buffalo and Jacqueline, for that introduction. Does anyone have any questions for our guests, I our two guests? A, I don't have a question, but I have a little something I might throw out there about my, my name that was given to me. And uh, it was back uh, when the movie Dances with the Bulls was quite popular. And... Uh, just for your information, my name given to me is Standing with Flapping Lips. <laughs> standing with Flapping Lips. Yes. Mm. Mm. Whoa. Did they tell you what it means? No, it was just my Navajo friend. Mm. It's not official. Yeah, I, I wonder I how many of y'all have, have in the name, you know? I have an official Indian name. Mm -hmm. It's the gondola, go to Steve. Translated, it means she who sees beyond the blue, as in record sky and physical, mm -hmm. because of my oil paintings. You have to see beyond the surface to pull out the personality of that person when you paint. Sure. And my tribe felt that I achieved what I was supposed to achieve, because the, the tribal belief really is, is you can have any name, but... A tribal name is given to you once you have have done something that they feel that you were assigned to do and you found it. Mm -hmm. So that's why that's my name. Can you tell me again. Sagandala, a goat to see, meaning she who sees beyond blue, as in physical and no oh, physical and spiritual. Yeah, physical and spiritual. That's wonderful. There's a longer version to it. I can't remember it. Yeah, it's a it. real long version. Yeah, mine, mine, mine is about this. You know, long. <laughs> when they did that, when they did the ceremony, I was getting ready to have back surgery, and Linda got to go to uh, Arkansas mm. to uh, see, and they wanted to uh, 
a picture of the a portrait painted of the first chief, if possible. So that was done. His name was Dragon Canoe. You probably know, I know the Chickamaugas. Mm -hmm. And part of the Chickamauga group was the part that came down in Texas. Yeah. That was uh, kind of a water the water. Yeah. Terry, a good friend of mine in North Carolina, I right? deal with a lot. He's North Carolina, he's a medicine person over there. Yeah. And, it's uh, so interesting. Which reminds me, as soon as I get some things on the back, I'll be checking out the chiefs for like the next one. <laughs> so, do we have any other Native American names? Okay, uh, I am my ancestry, which I only learned about after moving back here in '97, is Cherokee. So, until then, I didn't know I had actual uh, Native American ancestry. But when I was 15 years old, in Winsboro High School, I received a letter from a guy named Dewey Goomba at Mountain View, Oklahoma, who was old enough to be my father, had children my age and much older than I. And he and I remained friends until he died, uh, and close friends, and visited each other in person a lot, uh, back and forth. And when I was 15, his he, his, he had his mother give me a, a Kiowa name. He was a Kiowa. And um, my Kiowa name was and is Tahana Tali, which translates into Texan kid. And it meant so much to me. I think I told some of you that uh, when I was living in Philadelphia and working at Farm Journal Magazine, I was working on a master's program at the University of Pennsylvania, part-time, just taking one course at a time. And uh, in, the, in a course called The Folk Tale, um, I interviewed my uh, Jewy Goomba uh, by tape. Back then, it was little 50-yard uh, spools uh, uh, with... Uh, with the, the little reel-to-reel uh, -reel tape recorders of that era. And, and, and he was, uh, with, with that, he, he knew all the Sanday tales, which uh, was, was one of the uh, religious figures of the uh, Kiowas. And that was the basis for my paper in the folktale. And then uh, when he, he had a couple of strokes before he died and, couldn't, and eventually lost his speech, he, he and I both also sang and played a lot, and we would exchange uh, songs on, on those little reel-to-reel uh, -reel tape recorders. And uh, that, after he lost his speech and was in, in rehab at Lawton, in the Lawton Hospital, I went up there uh, and visited him at, that, at his re rehab center. And while he couldn't speak, he could still hear fine. And so I sang a lot of those songs that he and I had exchanged each other over the years. And of course, I could see his body language and his facial la language to see that he really appreciated that. Um, then, but probably the most sentimental thing I ever did was when my granddaughter turned five and was about to start to kindergarten, and she and I were and remain to this day extremely close um, I, I helped raise her, and uh, so I decided she needed to get her Kiowa name before she started to school, kindergarten. And I took her up there to Mountain View, and, and Dewey gave her a Kiowa name, uh, Tahana Me, which just means uh, Texan girl. The, and, um, you know, she, she's been grateful to me uh, for having done that for her uh, ever since. So I'm, I feel a whole lot more like a Kiowa than I do a Cherokee because I've had so much interaction, you know, with, uh, with that family, well, not just with Dewey, but with his entire family. Uh, so I feel like I, I, I am adopted into the Kiowa tribe, but I do have ancestry uh, on, my fa on my father's side as a Cherokee. The end. The end. <laughs> When, when you sang the songs, were they in the native tongue? No, no. Oh, well, n not for me. 
I, I sang in English, and, and he sang. He was really the same, a fan of the same kind of music I was. He, he and I both thought Jimmy Rogers, the late, the the, uh, the one uh, who died the year before I was born, uh, was the greatest country singer who ever lived, and and he could do the the Jimmy Rogers yodels at that time, and um, so we really sang the the same kind of songs, uh, and he never really sang. Uh, Kiowa songs. He he told the Kiowa folk tales, but he didn't he didn't sing to me in the Kiowa language at all. Uh, anyone else have uh, comments on that before Gary starts? Okay, we're ready to start with uh, Gary Fox doing the pro tonight's program on Native American flutes, building and playing. Right. What's you all? What's you all, Saturday? This presentation of mine is. I call it the adventures of flute making. This is probably the, the most fantastic woodworking project I've ever got into because of the history of it and all this. These are some of the various Native American style flutes that can be made with bare essential tools like pocket knife. There's some of them over here. Uh, in fact, me and my brother-in-law 20 years ago made our first one out of an old uh, a uh, bunch of wood off of uh, off of a pallet, and it it worked, but it wasn't real pretty to the sound. So started this a while back, and then we came on to what was happening, you know, Native American cultures and all this. But this goes far beyond that. I was really amazed how far these the flukes have gone. Okay, so. I'm going to be reading things, and hopefully I can read real well. All right. They were made of bare essential pocket knives, or you can take a lot of time or use with modern machine tools, which I use. And uh, it takes quite a while to do a flute with uh, a pocket knife. It's much faster and more precise. It's very interesting to me. I have been learning and uh, making flutes using other flute makers' plans, and that's where most of this stuff is done these days. You take an original and make a copy of it, and there's a reason for that. And as we get into the program, you'll find out. Uh, widely used practice in flute making is using diagrams of original sound proven flutes, then make a copy of it. Some original designs go back thousands of years and made of uh, animal bones, bird parts, and this is where you get into the history of flute making and the rivals of and the secrets of flute making. Um, material they are made of and where the originals came from. Uh, these flutes, they're different, different styles, and there's even some modern stuff. They're making flutes out of PVC, which does not hold the sound as well as wood. But it's a lot less work, I can tell you that, because when you go around on these things out, it's something else. All right. I gotta ask you a question here. Uh huh. You made an eagle bone whistle. A what? Eagle bone whistle. No, I haven't made an eagle bone whistle. I haven't made any kind of bird whistle. Have you? Yeah. Outstanding. That's great. Well, you know, I, I am just fascinated with some of this stuff, the way things work. Oh, yeah. It's so, and as we get into it, I found this program that I'm going to play for you all that is, uh, I think it's great. It's going to be audible, you know, I'm not going to be any pictures or anything. There are pictures there, but they're minute. And uh, anyhow, starting this project, I didn't realize how important the flute had been in establishing communication, no matter what the language is spoken. In Melody, this program from Flutopia, Flutopedia, points out the vast amount of information that I think you all will be interested in. I know, I now want to learn to play them as well. I make some, but I want to learn to play them as well. We got a man over here that plays pretty well, and I've le I'm been learning some things from him as well. Efton is a, is a flute player, 
and I'm, I'm green as green grass on it, but I'm learning how to make them. So if I can make them good, that's, that's great. Amateur. Well, you're my amateur, but we're going to give a display of how, how good he is. And I might follow, and you'll see how good he is and how bad I am. Okay. There, there is audio samples that, I have been, that have been recorded from the original sound creation uh, that really had no definite scale until the pentatonic minor scale was introduced and currently played with unison of other instruments that was made possible through that. Otherwise, they are a solo instrument. You had a guy out there, he made his flute, and the sound he got out of it, that was it. And there was no matching up with nothing else because they didn't talk back and forth. So progress has been made. Uh, here's some of the flutes with unique voices. And uh, we're going to get into this after a bit, and uh, Efton is going to play some, I'll play some. The flute's over here, uh, Efton's got some of his there, I've got some of the ones I've made from the Tweety Birds on up to the bass, and uh, it's, it's interesting stuff, especially for woodworking. Okay, getting into the uh, flute, Flutopedia. This is a brief history of Native American flute. It was called the beginnings of musicality. Human musicality mostly involved an environment rich with animal sounds. The rhythms that naturally sprang up with walking or working with tools probably spurred the first rhythmatic song between one and a half to seven million years ago. The voice makes the amazing versatile instrument as we know from now local vocal uh, traditions developed in isolated cultures however although the voice was probably our first melodimic instrument we only developed the anatomy needed for speech and articulate singing about 60,000 years ago Flutes followed soon after on the evolutionary time scale. The first flutes were rim blown. The oldest flutes were made from wing bones of griffin vultures, and they have a picture shown of it. It's a bone. And as well as one of the most mammoth tucks in ivory. Those flutes were found in present day Germany and France and have been dated to 33,000 to 43,000 years ago. Of course, flutes made of bone are far more likely to survive than wood, cane, and reed flutes. These first flutes were rim-blown flutes that required the player to make a immature, immature is a form of the mouth that it takes a lot to get the hang of, on the rim of the end of the flute in order to make a sound. Here's a recorded uh, uh, of the experiment of the experimental archaeologic ar archaeologist Wolf Hine on the replica of flutes at the right. Melody of ancient um, flute replica. And this is what this sounds like. to 5620 BC was found in present day central China at virtually the same time the Alonzo Amor bone flute was buried in a burial mound in Labrador. 
This was found intact and is the oldest flute that we can play and determine the scale. And that scale wasn't audible to other flutes. It also requires the immature that is played using the, uh, the rim blown style. And that is another flute that is Chinese and this uh, this song is called The Little Cabbage. You gotta get to it. Ah, come on.
with track four of Rainbird. Hopi flutes, a variant of the Anasazi style of rim blown flutes are the Hopi flutes. These instruments are best described by Dr. Richard W. Payne. In this expert, most of the track on Payne, uh, 2004. considerably uh, in size as far as population uh, it still exists. Hopi uh, are strong pageantists I guess you'd say. Uh, their, their ceremonies are, are very long and very s solemn and uh, very meaningful. Uh, in this country which is very dry uh, their survival depends upon uh, rain at proper times uh, to raise their corn and other uh, food. Uh, and so ceremonies are directed to this end. Now every other year, each village performs the snake ceremony. The snake ceremony is... Uh, is a very theatrical type of ceremony which involves uh, uh, poisonous reptiles and uh, occupies a period of, uh, of several days. The snakes are collected and uh, the ceremony is held and the snakes are then let loose to uh, propitiate the gods to bring rain. On alternate years, uh, the flute ceremony is enacted. The flute ceremony is quite different from the snake ceremony in being a very restrained, uh, quiet ceremony, which lasted uh, originally uh, 16 days, uh, with uh, everybody concentrating their mind upon uh, bringing rain and uh, the sound of the uh, native flute, the Hopi flute, uh, is heard during this period of time. Uh, on the last day of the ceremony, the, uh, the flute is uh, played from the so-called flute spring up to the top of the mesa, and uh, then the ceremony quietly disbands. Uh, the Hopi flute is an inblown flute, uh, really difficult to play, uh, and uh, at the present time is not uh, too well known uh, even by the, the Hopi. It uh, has a very pretty sound, uh, though a weak, very weak sound, but uh, this is intensified in the, 
in the kiva and the small rooms in which the ceremonies are held, particularly during the nights when uh, uh, everything is quiet. The Hopi ceremony is still enacted in uh, only two villages among the Hopi now. As with many cer ceremonies of the Hopi, the duration of the ceremony has been considerably curtailed uh, because uh, many of the people work uh, at a distance and they come only for the weekend. So generally the ceremony of the flute ceremony lasts uh, for, uh, for one weekend, uh, two days, uh, and uh, is accompanied not by the traditional Hopi flute, but by uh, recorders and by uh, whistles of various types. Now this uh, Hopi flute is, a, is an inblown flute. Chinese literature before 
800 BC. Transferred flutes depicted on the great Stupa and Senshi, India, first adopted on the sculpture titled The Return of Kapalavastu, shortly after 70 BC. The Western concert flute that has had a long and focused development. Then we get into ours, which is called the duck flute, the one that we play with today, or the popular one. Any flute that requires a player to make an immature, whether it is a rim-blown or side-blown transverse, is going to be a challenge to learn to play. Some players give up on the flute before they develop their immature, and some players abandon the instrument when they when the constant practice needed to maintain their immature becomes daunting. Enter the duck flute, an innovation that uses the instrument itself rather than the player's lips to create the right conditions for air to vibrate and create an air pressure wave that we hear in a sound. The duck, also called the flu, is a narrow channel that directs the stream of air across sound holes to the splitting edge of the instrument. This is best known by the moving image from Luvran Lubick Bach flute, which he's a German, definitely. It shows how the moving from right to left comes out the flue. What it has, it has a splitting edge and when the wind comes out of this blowhole, it goes off. Part of it goes up, part of it down, goes down. That's the trick. And it's very, very minute. And air holes are not allowed in the flute itself. I've been playing with that. It's a trip. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, the air vibration happens because of specific uh, shape of aspects of the flute but a particular shape of the flute is a sound hole in the splitting edge and the flute sound chamber. For more information, see flute vibrations. Duck flute trade-offs. Creating a sound of a duck flute is natural extension of the player's breath. The player simply breathes into the flute and the instrument sets up a air vibration that creates a sustained note. However, since these flutes essentially have a fixed immature, the player cannot control the shape of the immature, like on a flute where the player's lips can be adjusted. So the exchange for ease of play, there are some trade-offs. The range of duck flute tends to be more limited than immature flutes. The flute can, be, can gather moisture from the player's breath, since the shape of the flu is critical to the sound that is created, accumulated moisture can sound quality and even disrupt sound altogether. That's called a wet out. That's why you have two of whatever flute, or how many it's going to take, because it will wet out. There's a couple, couple different ways to try to cover that, but it's kind of experimental. Getting back to the history of flute development, <clears throat> there are duck flutes from many cultures. Clay or Canias from the early Maya culture in present day Belize dated between 800 and 500 BC. Clay flutes from Calma culture in present day Mexico dated from 300 BC to 250 Christian element. The medieval recorder, which became the central instrument in European music during the Middle Ages, the earliest recorder we currently have dates on is 1350 to 1399 Christian element. Like the Western concert flute, the recorder has enjoyed a long history and development of refinement through the Renaissance of Barque, U.S., and widely played today. Barque, U.S., I'm not sure. 
It's interesting that unlike rim-blown flutes, transverse flutes, and earliest examples of duck flutes in the America predate are examples of duck flutes from Europe and Asia thousands of years, or, or thousands of years. Were duck flutes invented independently in the New World or the Old World? Is it possible that there was a reverse migration of flute technology from New World back to the Old World? He doesn't know. The Native American flute is a variation of the duck flute, except that dramatically improves playability, especially for musicians with less experience. A slow air chamber that collects the breath before introducing into the flu, this acts as a bladder to smooth out variations of breath pressure and deliver the smoother airflow into the flu. That also lengthens the flute, which can help keep small flute more comfortable to play. A mouth hole, whose size is dependent on the size of the flu, and can be by the flute maker to suit the style of the Native American flute they're making. An external block that can be removed to clean and dry the flute. What they're saying there is you have different sizes of flutes and that, eternal, that external block is called the bird. And that's like a reed. The oldest existing Native American flute is called the Bell Trami Native American flute. And it was uh, discovered and collected by Italian explorer, explorer Glaucomo Constantino Beltrami on a journey through present day Minnesota in 1823. 23. Rim blown flutes were popular in many Native American cultures. In addition to broken flute cave flutes from 1620 to 1670 Christian era, the Hopewell tradition sandpipes, blown pipes from Hopewell tradition, flourished from about 200 BC to 500 Christian era. The gypsum cave Yuma style rim blown flute from approximately 500 to 750 Christian era. The Pueblo Bonito Mojave style flutes, which date from 690 to 944 Christian era range. The Range Creek flute, the mummy cave flutes dated from 1253 to 1284 CE, uh, Christian era, and many other examples of bone flutes and whistles such as the Ohio Valley flutes. To explain the path from rim blown style flutes, Native American flutes, we have several theories. You'll notice the most of these theories do not have reference citations. The names of these theories are my inventionist and the information is from discussions I've had in the past years with people of Native American flute community and my own research. The Oregon, the, the Oregon pipe theory poses that Native Americans worked as organ pipe makers, used the duck flute concept to wooden, or, wooden or, organ pipes to create hybrid instruments. The duck flute cross-pollination theory proposes that Native Americans studied the design of recorders possibly taken during conflicts with Europeans, or tarkas, as created a hybrid. The reed flute path, my personal favorite, proposes that the Native American flute evolved from a series of refinements that grew from developments making flutes from river cane. The Atal Ati evolution path was proposed by Robert L. Hall and suggests that the Atal Ati was a prototype of present day Native American flute. 
we get into the Papagou flute story expert. And that is the Papago Indians in southern uh, Arizona had a flute which uh, on first glance uh, appears somewhat like the uh, Hopi flute. It's a long, uh, long tubular flute, approximately 26 to 28 inches long. Uh, the origin of the Papago flute uh, is uh, indistinct, but there is evidence that this, is, uh, this flute is of great antiquity as uh, Portions of such a flute made of Phragmites communis, which is the material which was first used by the Papagos to make these flutes, it was found in Ventana Cave, which uh, dates uh, back to uh, ancient times before the birth of Christ. Uh, the Papago flute is, uh, is a very quiet flute played in the evening uh, to calm the children and calm the uh, animals. And uh, it's, it's a very pleasant sound in the quiet desert air. I'll play a little bit on this Papago flute. <laughs> Finally, look at what appeared to be the experimental block design of the Matic Kucha flute. Of course, these are flutes that appear from lineage, but there is established between these designs. You know, that was part of the other. There's a thing called the Maori account. The U.S. National Archive maintains a document written by George Gibbs in 1856. It contains observation by Gibbs of Indians of the Colorado River, California, and has accompanying vocabularies of Yuma and Mojave tribes. Included in this document are notes of Lieutenant Sylvester Mowry, who remarks which more especially concern the Mojave or Hamun Akhav and other tribes living above the, the Yumas, or who therefore, therefore little or nothing had been known. In the seventh page of the Maori remarks shown to the right, uh, particular they are, they have flute made of reeds which came of service in love making. A young buck would play all day to his sweetheart, no words passing save conveyed by his flute. The first ethnographic record was made in March of 1890 of Newell Joseph singing the Passamagoquati snake song. It was made by the American anthropologist Jesse Walter Fuix, 1850 to 1930 using a new wax cylinder recording technology invented by Thomas Edison. Felix was initially trained as a zoologist at Harvard University, then later broadened his interest, broadened his interest into include anthropology and archaeology and provide the earliest ethnomusicological recordings. There are about 20,000 Native American field work recordings on file in wax cylinders. About 10,000 cylinder recordings are archive of Folk Culture Center in the United States Library of Congress, including the March 1890 Passamaquoddy Snake Song, which was transferred to 
the library by Peabody Museum of Harvard University. The indigenous movement, this is one that we study quite a bit. In the late 19th century, the movement began in the U.S. to incorporate indigenous ethnic themes into classical composition. A facet of this movement called the indigenous movement began to showcase Native American traditions at least the portion of traditions that was accessible to classical composers of the time. From about 1890 through the 1920s, American classical uh, composers borrowed uh, American Indian themes and synthesized them with Western classical music forms and principles. At some time, it was called the, the Progressive Era. At some time, as Native American themes were getting wide exposure in the indigenous movement, culture and music among indigenous peoples themselves entered a period of suppression that would last through the 1940s. As part of the Progressive Era, and possibly sparked by the massacre of Wounded Knee, Creek, now known National uh, Historic Landmark, in late 1890, federal policymakers emphasized the assimilation of Native American cultures into mainstream American culture. The U.S. government discouraged or imposed bans on many forms of traditional religious practices, including sun dance, use of peyote in ceremonial settings, and observance of potlatch rituals. A program was established to separate children from influences of their families and cultures and train them at distant boarding schools. When our am amrid world turned upside down with the dissolution and dislocation of tribal communities by encroaching colon uh, colonial expansionism, many songs, stories, and family histories contained within the lyrical message of traditional music and many forms of material culture as well were cast aside or forgotten in the struggle for survival. Still, throughout the reservation period, Certain individuals and families with tribal communities all over the North America encouraged the Underground Railroad of mystic sacred ceremonies and chants of first original people, enabling remnants of the old culture to be passed on each succeeding generation of indigenous. As with many attempts to eradicate indigenous cultures, Native singers, dancers, and musicians created new opportunities through musical performance to resist and manipulate those who do the same policy initiatives. The Native American flute experienced a severe decline, decline during the period, almost to the point of eradication. Rebirth. Can I, can I interject something? Certainly. Um, he spoke of something. Um, the two people who brought the Sundance back into public eye were people who taught me the Lakota way. Uh, Frank Poolstrow and CeeLo Blackrow were the two that brought it back into the public eye. They both told me that uh, their vision was that they were going to get put in jail because they brought the Sundance back out in the public. Yeah. Uh, very interesting individuals. Both of them have, well, Frank's still here, but uh, Steve Black Co. has passed on. But uh, yeah, that was a very interesting thing. Mm -hmm. That particular ceremony was uh, finally brought back to light, as it were. Yeah, there's been a lot of trials and tribulations go go through uh, things. Mm -hmm. During the 1940s, 
the policies towards Native American culture began to soften, and flute traditions resurfaced. In an amazing collaboration between cultures, Native American flute players as well as enthusiasts and researchers from the outside of Native cultures were central in supporting the rebirth. One central figure, Bilo Kozad, a Kiowa flute player who made historic recordings for the U.S. Library of Congress, 1941. Here is expert excerpt from one of the tracks that he recorded. I'm a Kyle tribe. My daddy, he's the chief of the Apache Indian, and he's the first one who went to Washington City, see the Uncle Sam, and a lot of cows went well with him, and, uh, and they all died out, and I'm only one living, the oldest one living today. I'm 77 years old now. I'm pretty old, and uh, I like to give you some kind of news that about this music, music I got, you know, and, and if you like it, I'll go and fix it up for you, sing for you, and you could have that long as you live, and uh, you remember me, and tell all your friends uh, that, uh, that you saw me right here at this Riverside Indian School. I like to play music for you and to put good songs that, that I know myself, I made it myself. Good songs that I'm going to put it in for you. And keep it as long as you live. Now, I got this music from way back in, in Montana. So one of a poor boy, he, he, he got no home and he went up on the mountain and stayed up four nights there and he learned it, learned this music and got it, he got it from uh, some kind of spirit to give it, he give it to him, show him to make it this way and make it good music and uh, keep it, keep it as long as you live and you make your good living because these trees are uh, good trees, uh, we call cedar trees, cedar, cedar trees, it's a great tree you know. And that's where he got this. He's an orphan boy. He ain't got no home. From now on, he got this music, and he's coming to well off. He got got well off women's and good home, and he's well off boys, and he got raised children. And today, today I think uh, I'm the one of them because that children grown up and just I want to play it for you to I want you to hear good. of a state of the union 
Declaration for American Folk Music Circa in the 1940s. The collection concluded with Kozad's performance entitled Kiowa Story of the Flute, in which the artist, then in his 70s, details how wooden flute song he plays was obtained from an ancestor who learned from the spirit after these field recordings were first issued. They influenced several generations of modern artists, ranging from classical composer Aaron Copeland to San Francisco psychedelic rock group, The Jefferson Airplane. It was also crucial recording in helping to spark the 1960s folk music revival. Native American music, as represented by Kozad, however, did not benefit greatly from this type of interest, which focused more on American old-time music, and particularly blues. But the art of Native American flute playing would receive a bigger boost in the 1980s. As the genre known as New Age music began opening up entirely new markets, the peaceful, slow, and haunting sounds of the Native American flute players fit quite snugly into the concept. Although being lumped together with a piano playing of George Winston and displays of incense and crystals may not have been Bello Kozad's what he had in mind. Among other Native American players that gained prominence with was Dan Red Buffalo, Lakota, Richard Fulbul, Lakota, George Watchtaker, Comanche, Abel Big Bow, Kiowa, Woodrow Haney, Seminole, Doc Payne. One key figure is Richard Payne, MD, of Oklahoma City, Oklahoma. Doc Payne is known in the Native American flute community as Tubat, a Indian given name described his early flute experiences to me in 2002. When he began traveling to Central and South American countries for the U.S. Armed Forces to study the progression of disease, he became enchanted with the indigenous muse he found and the sounds of local flutes. And this is an expert by uh, Dr. Payne. It's called the Kiowa Love Song. <laughs> Given 
other information on Plains Indian courting flute. And here's the expert. It's Comanche Moon Song. Many of the songs that was composed by individuals were composed by individuals that was inspired by an animal or an incident that happened to them individually. And this particular one was made because I was inspired by how beautiful the moon can shine during both the winter time and the summertime. I call it the Comanche moon. <laughs> Some made flute crafting their livelihood. Some learned crafts from relatives of previous generations, Hawk Little John, who actually began making flutes in the 1950s, and Tim Spotted Wolf learned from their grandfathers, while Sonny Navaquaya learned from his father, Doc Tate. Others met Dr. Payne and discovered the wealth of the knowledge, including Dr. Oliver Jones and Michael Graham Allen. Many turned to historic flutes for their inspiration, including Raven Charles King and Arnold Richardson. And there were a number that taught themselves, including Carl Running Deer, Zachariah Blackburn, and Lou Paxton Price. In the early 1980s, added a few more makers, included Lakota George Estes and Ken Light. The Coyote Old Man Connection. Then, in the 1980s, a friendship developed between Doc Payne and Michael Graham Allen that would eventually set a new standard for tunings on the Native American flute. According to Butch Hall, Personal Communication, and others, Michael was experienced player at the Sakabachi, a Japanese rim-blown flute that had traditionally used in the pentatomic minor scale as the primary scale. Doc Payne showed Michael the details and construction techniques of the Native American style flutes, and Michael also began drafting them. However, ultimately used the pentatomic minor scale that he knew well from the Sakabachi experience. These early flutes by Michael Graham Allen were five-hole flutes, which echoed the style and natured pentatomic progression of the Sakabachi. Michael's flutes, under the name Coyote Old Man Flutes, became popular among players and many makers, including Kaya Mayberger, and maker of my first Native American flute, began crafting flutes heavily, influenced by Doc Payne and Coyote Old Man construction style by using pentatomic minor scale as the primary tuning. And what that does, that makes them talk, because they are on a scale. 
but it also, this is not saying this here, but what I've found, there's, I forget how many, there's probably 12 different uh, fundamental notes that you have to establish when you're making this flute. Because one flute can play one kind of song, depending on what the fundamental note is. But then that goes into octaves and all kinds of scientific jargon that I'm kind of dealing with. And it's fantastic. It really is. But, so, it goes into that. Getting into the last part here. This was followed by the culture of informal flute circles that sprang up to feed the interest of players and makers as well as workshops to provide basic education and forum for music making. The internet provides the news for people to exchange information, recordings, and more recently, live open mic sessions. And perhaps the most importantly, people who had knowledge of history and the culture surrounding the Native American flute were drawn to the instruments simply because of the haunting sound. Many who had been turned off by the structure of technical aspects of studying Western style music were drawn to the inherent ease of making music on an instrument and the invitation to play it from the heart. The renaissance of the Native American flute was reflected in a re renaissance of each player's musicality and self-expression and was an invention to begin exploring the cultures and traditions surrounding the Native American flute. And that's their report. But it's interesting to me to know that humans started making music by blowing into animal bones. Originally, those were brought into being for purposes of meditation. Mm -hmm. Because it, you were able to bring your vibratory rates down or up wherever you needed them to be, to be more in tune with the spirit realm. And that was the reason for it. Ah. History is fantastic. Oh yeah, it is. Yeah. yeah, and helping bring back this Indian culture for me, along with what I like woodworking, uh, can be used to calm your 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 senses, mm -hmm. you know. Yeah. And like you're talking, uh, and and mellow, and the rhythms of life is is good medicine. And that's a, that's a tool that's used. And now I want to show you where I am with flute. You're not up there with Coyote Open? Huh? You're not up there with Coyote Open? Yeah. <laughs> Efton and, and me is going to do some, he's the, he's the pro. I'm, okay, uh, that'll work. But, okay, oh, oh, another thing, one of the things that they, they prophesy and all this stuff, they say, well, if you come across the guy that's got a bunch of flutes, Sometimes it's not best to mouth them because you never know what that guy might have had. Yeah, that's you know? a true story. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So at any rate, but when they go to sell a flute, you know, uh, like these flute sellers, they say, "Hey, you know, you, we gotta sanitize this thing before you do this and that." Yeah. Yeah. But uh, so that's that's something that you just gotta look at. Of course, not everybody got hoof and mouth disease or nothing, but you know, you never know. You never know. <laughs> So these are, uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to blow some of these on the job. I kind of like a little Tweety Bird for myself. I was going to put them out there. He's got this, this is a little uh, cane. Yeah. And I told him, I said, see these ants down here? Texas is famous for the fire. Oh, yeah. Right. So I made this little marching thing for the, uh, the fire ant. And then you can go on and on and on. Yeah, And then we have the other little Tweety Birds. And some of these, uh, I put them in a bag and I don't know if they're going to be in tune. you got to move around the bird. This uh -huh. is the bird. Uh -huh. Okay. And here is another little reed. And you can take, you can make this with a pocket knife. It'll take you a while to do it. But there you go. Every one of them's got a little bit different voice. Because mm -hmm. they're all, this one is out of cherry, and I like this one. I, I made this one, I said, that 
looks pretty cool. Okay. What, is, what is your favorite material? My favorite material? Well, I like hardwood, to tell you the truth. Uh, hardwood, is, it holds a, it holds a uh, real uh, sound to it, and we'll get into that deeper. Uh, with the big one. This right here, this is one of the first things I made. I was a sailor for a while. My dad was really? a boat's mate, yeah, and I was a ship fitter. Well, I didn't oh, you were a ship fitter, I was a CB. Were you a CB? All right, there you go. Well, we need we need construction people. He's a twenty-two year retired. So at any oh, rate, yeah. So at any no, rate, I did my three and got out. Yeah. <laughs> I, I I got out and I said, you know, I'm missing something here, and by golly, you know, so I didn't went back and did fifteen more. But at any rate, they have some of these little songs that uh, lock in the song, and it's called "I'm Thinking About When I Was a Sailor." Oh yeah. And like I said, this ain't the greatest clue. Of course, you gotta. What is that material? Gary, what what is that material on the white one? Oh, this is PVC. This is uh, this is Schedule 40 PVC. This is the cheating way to make a flute. Yep. But I have some others here and. Yeah, they sound like a recorder. Oh, a while ago when you said your favorite is hardwoods, there's a lot of hardwoods. Give yeah. give some examples. Walnut, mahogany. That's mahogany. Uh -huh. These here, these here are pine and western red cedar. You know this one right here. I got some junk wood. I got it off of a uh, a uh, pallet. Uh -huh. Really hard. I haven't figured out what kind of wood that is yet. Could be teak, I don't know. But this is what it sounds like. And uh, this one here, I blew it with it. Look, these are these are four whole Cherokee flutes. Uh -huh. Look, tell us about some are four, some are five, some are six whole. What, what? Okay, what happened there? <laughs> uh, I've been studying stuff with a guy by the name of, not with him, but his studies. His name is Charlie Montecubo. And he's been making flute for 40 years. Really got his stuff together. He made his first one with a pocket knife, like me and Bob, one his brother. Mm -hmm. And mine, you know, we they look pretty good. The beating won't look better than the flute, you know. So, at any rate, um, your question was again? My question is, what is the difference between the four hole, five hole, six hole? Okay, four hole by Charlie. This is a Cherokee flute. Four, four holes. He said you can play anything on a four hole. He will not make a six hole. He said there's no reason for it. Partly because of the pentatonic minor scale that they talked about there. He said, I don't know why they had six holes. What are they going to do with that six hole? Well, there's some that's got seven holes because they put them in the bottom. And this is something you're asking that question. You see that little booger right there? Oh, yeah. I remember when I was a rug rat. Mm -hmm. Oh, we're going to make noise, right? And it is an introduction to the thing. This thing got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and a, and a octave oh. hole here, and then an octave on the bottom. Eight, nine holes. But this was something that I think was introduced by the European stuff. Yeah. Yeah. And then oboes and all this kind of stuff. Yeah. Now another one, you get in and one. This is something I ain't paid to matter. Well, honey, for sure that the uh, what the five the five hole. Okay, the five hole is and, the one that we use for pentatonic scale. Right. And what you happens can, if you play the six hole? You can do this though. Uh, okay, this is six holes. This right here is a um, mahogany. This I have six holes in it. Actually, this was patterned off of Eston's flute. Mm. And that's how they're doing a lot of flutes. Because there is no set of instructions. It's kind of experimental. Mm. If you want to change a note, you can go half the size of the round. The thing that makes the whole the, the uh, sound of this flute is the bore, the size of the bore, the holes, where they are on the, the bore, this is the head, this is the foot. Right. This here is the splitting edge. That's where your air comes in. As this is made, you have a hole that goes 
here, there's a sound chamber which is bigger. It comes up, goes through the bird. This is the bird. And it passes through here and it goes back down to the splitting edge and that's where your wind comes in. You have the splitting edge and it goes bang like that. Part out, part in. The stuff that goes in makes a vibration. And that, to get that right. And these things can wet out, as it was talked about, because we're blowing into it. Well. But, okay, and, and to your answer there. You still haven't gotten to the. The six hole. Six hole. What you do when you have a six hole is you hold. What you do with a six hole, you block off that hole right there. Because this is what we have. We have a five hole now. Well, then, then, why, then why put six holes? That's, why that's, what, they, that's, that's what, what Charlie it. says. I don't understand why they did that. He said there might have been something to it. But that's what they did in earlier years. Oh, no, it, it gives you a variance in tone. When you it does, it does. That other, that other. Now this, this right here, if I, if I take this, all right, and I'm, it does give you a variance in tone, but doing half steps and all this, which I haven't got into oh, yeah. heavily, you can half step it, you can do all kinds of things. Uh, Efton knows this stuff better. Well, right maybe here. that, you know, that hole could possibly. Uh, okay. Now this, if you're, uh, when you close, when you close all the holes, this is what you call the fundamental note. Right. So if this fundamental note is a, usually in a bigger flute, it is. A B or a C. Mm -hmm. Okay. F sharp is very popular, and A is popular. G is, you know, there's uh, I forget how many. Uh, if I had a schematic with me and all this, but it's it's quite a science, it really is. When you can accomplish this, you can just you can play well, the role. If the bird wasn't on there, what would happen? Wouldn't play. Nothing out. but air. Yeah. If the bird ain't there, check this out. That's what happens. And when you put this on here, okay, and you got to get this thing right. See, you got the inside hole here. This is the blow hole. It goes up through the flue. That's the that flue. And that's got to be so so. You got to put that thing. Any kind of any kind of unsmoothness, you're going to get blow out of it. You're going to get that blow effect. It's going to be fuzzy. Okay. And then you got to get this thing tight enough. And another thing, this bird, the bottom of it, has got to be smooth. Smooth. All right. So I put this up here. Now that's generally where it's at. And then I start checking it out. And then the other thing is learning how to breathe with this. Effort knows better than I do. Because it's... Not...
I can't get it together. They're and I figured good, so. it's a different sound, you know. <laughs> You'll get lightheaded blowing this thing, I guarantee oh, yeah. you. You'd be passing out. I watched that guy with the ones that are that big around and he's doing all the bass sound. And it's beautiful. Here's another little one I made, a friend of mine, and these are all patterned off of something. I either have Charlie's book that I've used these with, and I've been doing this about a month and a half now. I got me a, I got me a lathe. And that oh, did you? Uh -huh. About 185 bucks, best 185 I spent, and that's to smooth things out. This little booger right here it, it is set. This Efton's got one that is beautiful. bands are called sweet potatoes. Oh, is that what it is? They have one, it's, it's a dual, it's a drone. They yeah. call it a drone, and Charlie blew one, and it, it shows you how to make one, for that matter, but you got two flutes on two sides, and it, yeah. it just unison, it, it vibrates, it's fantastic. Ah, it sounds like a real masterpiece to me. Are not traditional. These great big long jobs are not traditional. 
traditional, traditional one is something on the order of this. Okay. Ain't nobody holds no baseball bat around in campfire way back here. But they got some nice sounds. Super, super lucky 
you're going to get a good sound when you make this thing. The first thing you're going to do when you start growing your holes, you're going to use a, uh, an eighth inch bit, a little bitty job, because you don't know what octave that's going to be, because you're going to have to cut this off as well to get your fundamental note. If you want a fundamental note of a C or a B, which is for a long bass flute, that's what you have to do. If you cut it back too far, then you've got to go into another fundamental note. Mm -hmm. Or there is a trick that I haven't mastered yet, and that's called the plug. Actually, I have mastered it somehow. This is one that I blew. When I put this together, this little flute, I cut this down to where everything was sitting there. You have to have this to where it comes across this cutting edge, this, so you're getting, making a sound. Okay? When, as I explained, when you blow into that, part of it goes up, part of it goes down, the vibration is what makes the sound. When you come down here, okay, that's by uncovering the holes. Now, what makes a difference is the size of your bore, that will offset everything. And the size of the bore, and what I had went wrong, it broke off down here. It was longer than this. Mm. So I had to shorten it up, and I'm saying, oh man, the fundamental note is gone. So how am I going to do that? Well, I looked at Charlie's stuff, he says, you want to lengthen it? He says, the longer it is, the lower it is. The lower your octave. Mm -hmm. Now, if you put a plug in there, you're going to get a lower octave. So you can save it. Otherwise, you can throw it away. Right? You never want to throw one away. This here, the shorter it is, the higher the octave. Also, the smaller the hole, the lower, the smaller the hole, the lower the octave, and it depends on what the fundamental load is. There's all kinds of additives that goes in there to make this thing <laughs> whatever you're going to do. Okay, and I ain't mastering it all. But it is an art, it really is. And then the other thing is, if I want to make this a sharp note, you have flats, I, I forget what they call the other, normal note, like a G, you got a G flat, G, and G sharp. If you want to make that sharp, which is higher octave, you make the whole wider. There's all these little characteristics you use. I'm, I'm so how do, you, how do you know where to start? How do you know where to start? by something that somebody else has already done. <laughs> and that is copy it. Copy it. Because <laughs> it's got to be. And then if you do that, it's like this right here. The now hole's got to be a i got to work on this one. Bottom. You can hear this it's thing okay. jump octave. All right? These, these two right here. OK, it's not, it's airy, right? What I want to have to do with this, and this is something else that happens with these okay, things. Wait, what this is saying. really, this all adds together. If it's 70 degrees, that's the magic temperature. You go out and you do something that's 80 degrees or 40 degrees, you ain't going to get the same sound out of this thing. And then the other thing is, if you go out and the wind's blowing, you out and try to play this in the wind, you might not get nothing out of it. It's got all kinds of characteristics. I mean, this is a beast, okay? <laughs> It'll drive you nuts, but it's beautiful. Some of the things you can get. Well, Efton, Efton can play much better than I can. But what, what I told him, I said, you know what would really be cool? We got these, we got these gals that play the uh, Bill Marsh. There's 12 of them. I think there's 12. I, I video them. And I said, wouldn't it be something if we set up a jam, you know, because they play flutes and guitars? They do, and it's beautiful. And then the other thing is, um, I told him, I said, what we need to do is dueling banjos with a flute. Yeah. You know? Oh, yeah. So let's do it. Hey, Jerry. Which one you want to start with? Hey, before you start, uh, Jerry and Efton, the, the ladies he was talking about that plays the dulcimers, Five of them are going to be on the stage Saturday night. 
that right? tomorrow, Fantastic. day after tomorrow night, they'll be up there on this stage. I won't be because I have a wedding to do Saturday. I've got to go to a wedding. Well, what are you doing at the wedding? Huh? What are you doing? Are you performing will, the wedding? I'm not sure, but Are somebody, you officiating at it? Somebody tell, issued tell a the, warning. Tell the younger woman that's boys married. Oh, it's, it's Wait, you my, this? I call him my older brother. Samuel is 87 years old. Uh, he is a preacher, has been preaching since he was 17. Hmm. All right. His wife passed, and after about a month, he called me and says, how long am I supposed to wait? I said, did you complete your contract? Yeah. Did you ever see any place in scripture that God said you had to wait any particular time? No. I said, so if you found someone that is acceptable, proceed. Well, he found an 80-year-old. I told him, you cradle robber, you. <laughs> <laughs> you know what he needs? He needs a love flute, man. Uh, and it was so funny. I said, you're, you're a cradle robber. She's 80 years old. Yeah, she's never had a man. <laughs> I almost, I, I went, oh, my word. Uh, it was really quite comical, but I've got to be there for his wedding. He's kind of like my older brother. Uh, we get in discussions, spiritual discussions, and, and so forth, deeply, quite often. Is that the one you're going to use? Okay, uh, so are y'all going to do uh, some duets or something, or what? Yeah, okay, here we go. I'm going I'm to do the bass note, and you go take off with us. Streets of Laredo, oh. yeah. Last night I was walking in the streets of Laredo. Yeah, that's right. You know, by the young cowboy, all covered in cotton or something like that. I did. <laughs> you sang that, it was beautiful. We had a chance to it play was. it. Thank you. This art center one, one Christmas Eve. Oh. He asked me to. So what's, what's next, Jerry? Huh? What's next? I, I guess that's what we are. We're all amateurs. Okay, we know what. Right. We're just happy as clams. And what can we say? Okay. So well, that, is that the program? Are we done? Yeah. yeah okay. Uh, it was really, really neat doing it. Though. He's gonna play. Yeah. Well, y'all to 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 wind it up. Well, y'all to stand up and be together on the last, the very last portion here. Do it. Do 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 it. Do do either do do that one a little bit more or another one or whichever works for you. Uh, oh, but stand close together. Why don't they? Well, why don't you have them? We we look at this. Show Dad. Yeah. Show Dad. Yeah. Why don't you have them stand over there with a clear background? Instead? That would work better if you don't mind getting over here. Oh, back here. Oh, yeah. by, yeah. by the wall or the plain plain background. Plain background. Gary had mentioned something about Butch Hall in his presentation, and this is a Butch Hall flute. Yeah, oh, is it? First, first okay. One I Further down, Gary. Over, over. Oh, okay. Yeah. Just, just get away from the deal so we can oh, see yeah. just, just y'all. Move, move down a, a little further, Efton, yeah. That's good. Okay, now go ahead. Uh, this will be the final shot on the video. Go ahead. <laughs> See? 
Thank you. Better than I am. Uh, <laughs> Gary Fox and uh, Efton Edwards concluding the video tonight. Okay, I'm, I'm going to I'm, I'm going to cut it off right now.